know when you are live. Okay. So, good morning to uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, welcome to the MOES webinar series. It is our pleasure and honor to host uh, MOES Lifetime Excellence Awardee, Dr. Satish R. Shete, to give this lecture. Uh, Dr. Shete is the former director of National Institute of Oceanography, Goa, and the former VC of Goa University. His work on the monsoon driven currents along the Indian coast enhanced the understanding of the phenomena, assisted him in proposing mechanisms impacting their existence. In addition, he has elucidated annual variations in the sea surface temperatures in Arabian Sea by developing a mixed layer model. His other studies include the thermal fields in the North Indian Ocean and their relationships with the Indian summer monsoon. Uh, it's variability, the variability of sea levels along Indian coast, dynamics of Indian estuaries, and a first time study of the hydrology of rivers feeding those estuaries. I kindly request Dr. Shete to deliver the talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, the title of my talk is uh, Understanding the Dynamics and Thermodynamics of the North Indian Ocean, Major st Strides Since Independence and uh, Challenges Ahead. Now, uh, I picked up this topic primarily because we entered the 75th anniversary year yesterday of independent India. And I thought uh, I should use this occasion to identify some major strides which have been made in understanding both atmosphere and oceanic phenomena that are of concern to India. Uh, uh, and uh, I would like to know what has been, uh, I would like to talk about what has happened since independence uh, with regard to this. Now, uh, I think this is also a good occasion to look at some of the challenges that we have in order to improve our understanding of uh, the oceans. So that will be the second part of my talk. And uh, uh, before I start, I let me thank uh, the Ministry of Earth Sciences for the privilege to deliver this talk. Uh, let me just put things in perspective. Uh, independence was on 15th of August, 1947. The first general election took place between October 51 and February 52. And IIOE, the International Indian Ocean Expedition, started in 1959. The preparation for it go back uh, were during the previous uh, four or five years. So in essence, the decision to participate in IIOE uh, was uh, taken by the first government, which uh, formed after independence. IIOE was a big enterprise, 20 countries, 40 ships participated, hundreds of researchers took place in the data collection as well as analysis. IIOE is in a way uh, 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 important milestone that uh, uh, marks the beginning of oceanography in India. The question now is, has our understanding of the North Indian Ocean changed since the IIOE days? And if yes, uh, what is the singular most important change? I'm sure every scientist, oceanographer in particular, will have uh, his or her pet answer to this question. So uh, I don't want to claim that uh, whatever answer which I give is the answer, uh, but I would like to convince you of uh, what I'm going to uh, state. First of all, I think our understanding has changed quite dramatically. And the major change that has occurred, probably the most important change which has occurred, 
is that the importance that used to be given to phenomena over the Arabian Sea has now shifted to phenomena over the Bay of Bengal. And this is with respect to two things. The state of thermodynamics, that's the air-sea coupling that controls rainfall over India, is today recognized <coughs> as something which uh, happens over the Bay of Bengal much more effectively than elsewhere. The second and the more important of the two is that the seat of dynamics of waters around India is now firmly in the Bay of Bengal. Now, a caveat. Uh, when I talk about air-sea coupling, uh, you should know that I'm no expert in atmospheric sciences. Uh, the reason why I included it, and I will start with it, is because I want to highlight a special feature of uh, the Bay of Bengal. And that feature is related to the stratification uh, in the Bay of Bengal, something that was known during IIOE, but I think subsequent work carried out uh, on board ships of India uh, helped to define it much better. I should also know, uh, note that uh, during IIOE, and uh, the almost a decade following the IIOE, it was felt that the sea surface temperature over the Arabian Sea could influence rainfall over India. If you look at the papers from those days, there are uh, sensitivity experiments which have been carried out uh, with uh, the goal of determining how sensitive rainfall over India is to SST variations over the Arabian Sea. Uh, this view, however, started changing because of developments in the uh, 1980s. Uh, first, it was realized that the sea surface temperature over tropical uh, oceanic areas. By the way, uh, let me also point out, uh, this talk, uh, most of it, is sort of a broad sweep talk. So when I, uh, I will only identify the most important ideas that have emerged without giving a historical perspective on it, nor identifying who contributed uh, what. I will just focus on the ideas. And uh, until I go right towards the end, where there is uh, uh, just a single study, so I will uh, highlight that. So, uh, it was realized in 1980s that SST over tropical oceans uh, needs to be above a threshold somewhere of the order of 28 degrees to support convection over the ocean. And it was also realized that Arabian Sea is much too cool because of the wind-induced upwelling along its western boundary. The second important thing that happened over the, during the 1980s is that the importance of low pressure systems uh, as primary providers of uh, rainfall uh, over, the, over a large area of India was recognized uh, quantitatively. Its uh, uh, properties were, uh, became better known through analysis uh, and uh, I think it is generally a view that persists today. Now, if I combine the last two statements, uh, in order to support formation of LPS, uh, the Bay of Bengal has to stay warm. And uh, this is uh, uh, where I, uh, th this is where the contribution of uh, uh, Indian uh, researchers uh, played an important role uh, by pointing out that the nearest uh, surface stratification is controlled primarily by salinity variation. And this sort of stratification allows the bay to recover its temperature uh, if it gets cooled by the presence of an LPS when the winds could go up uh, and mixing could occur in the ocean surface. 
the second one and uh, not so well recognized uh, perhaps not so well studied is that coastal upwelling is weak but it is weak for two reasons one is the uh, winds over the bay of bengal are weaker than what you certainly weaker than uh, what uh, exists over the arabian sea but now there is also an awareness that there are equatorial effects which enter the bay of bengal from the equator and they tend to kill the upwelling induced by local winds say along the western boundary of the bay or the east coast of india uh, this is uh, an important point that i will be talking about and i will it also this equatorial impact that we were not aware of when uh, iioe uh, t- took place is uh, an important uh, development in the last few years it was uh, helped by a collection of hydrographic data but i think the major boost for it came uh, when uh, uh, altimeter data started becoming available a major boost for uh, some of the statements that i made here today also came from other methods of data collection uh, for example the trim uh, mission the provided uh, a description of rainfall that we didn't have a description of rainfall both over land and sea uh, with a resolution that was not available and this made it clear that things start happening over the bay of bengal and then they migrate towards the continental region except for those areas where bo- topography plays a role and uh, i think this realization is uh, only after high resolution data became available prior to that we were aware that uh, that uh, lps is form over the bay of bengal and then they bring precipitation over uh, india uh let me go to the uh, next topic which is the dynamics of the region this uh, the major conclusions of ioe were summarized i mean primarily from the interest of uh, oceanographers in general but uh, physical oceanographers in particular were summarized by klaus witke in a remarkable atlas that he put together uh, putting bringing uh, all the data of uh, ioe <coughs> under one umbrella <coughs> and <coughs> two years later in 1973 he <coughs> published a review of uh, what was learned from uh, iioe in it he made use of two figures uh, what i've done is instead of using his figures i'm using the figures from the atlas uh, that uh, that he had taken those two figures from because these are in color and mix things a little more clearer what i would like to bring to your notice is if you look at july august distribution of dynamic topography this is dynamic topography in centimeters uh, in the bay of bengal that whole dis- description is based on number of stations that is this small point which could be counted on the fingers of one hand uh situation is a little better during january february but not a whole lot better it is somewhat better in the arabian sea but again not a whole lot better so this region the vicinity of uh, the indian ocean uh, of the indian subcontinent uh, was uh, data poor and uh, i think hydrographic data that were collected by indian research vessels uh, were very important and the altimeter data subsequently 
played uh, a major role in integrating uh, hydrographic uh, information. So if I look go by the hydrography uh, as described in these two figures, uh, not a whole lot seems to be happening in the Bay of Bengal. You find a high in the middle of the basin during the both the season and something happening around it uh, uh, during these two seasons. Now, let me ask the question, if I were to use the modern version of hydrographic data, how would the picture be different from these two figures? And uh, that's what I've done here. Uh, this is hydrographic data based on absolute dynamic topography, uh, which is, uh, has been distributed by that is ADT is absolute dynamic topography, distributed by Aviso or Copernicus service, and they give daily value of absolute dynamic topography, geostrophic velocity, and uh, every day, and the data are available up to date. Now I've taken the, a data set that goes from 1993 to 2019, so roughly 27 years. Use those 27 years of daily values to construct the climatology. So taken every day value for 27 years to construct that day's value in the climatology. And I will use it quite extensively to uh, show you how it varies as uh, uh, by just arranging the daily values one after another and making a movie out of it. Okay, so uh, before I do that, uh, let me uh, show you what happens if I constructed the equivalent of this picture using the kind of data which are available with altimeter now. First of all, you notice uh, I pointed out to you earlier that a high was uh, uh, was sort of assigned to the Bay of Bengal, both during January, February and July, August. Uh, now we know that the situation is quite different. During January, February, there is a low in sea level over most of the Bay of Bengal. During July, August, there is a high, a distinct high, which hugs the eastern boundary of the Bay of Bengal. And I think we need to, uh, the dynamics that lead to these changes are quite interesting. You will uh, see it in the movie that I will show you, but uh, just to make you aware of where to look and what to look for, let me point out to certain events. In January, an upwelling favorable equatorial Kelvin wave hits Sumatra. So Kelvin wave propagates eastward along the equator, it hits Sumatra. Its reflection produces a low levels in the Bay of Bengal because of a Rossby wave, uh, a upwelling favorable Rossby wave that first forms along the eastern boundary of the basin and then spreads westward. In May, something just the opposite happens. A spring Whitkey jet, that is an equatorial Kelvin wave, but a downwelling favorable Kelvin wave propagates eastward and hits the Sumatra coast. Again, it propagate it, its reflection is in the form of Rossby waves, which form along the eastern boundary, then propagate westward, and some of the, those impacts uh, follow the uh, boundaries of the basin. In November, another jet forms with a similar high, uh, uh, hits the eastern boundary, Sumatra, and again does the same thing. On this occasion, however, you can see that something starts propagating along the east coast of India, and you can see it in the movie, that, that effect 
goes all the way around Sri Lanka and sets up the West India Coastal Current. It then propagates, it's a Rossby wave, it propagates offshore and it can be seen going all the way to the coast of Somalia where it reaches by next March. This is something which was not expected during IOUE days. That's something that happens in the Bay of Bengal will have an impact on the Somali region. And I will then show you the same events in the geostrophic velocity, also distributed by Abiso, from which I've just made a climatology. Okay, so let me run the first movie. And uh, please uh, keep in mind those events which I showed you. Okay. This is January, February, you find low happening along the uh, coast. By April, May, that low has turned into a high, but you don't see a whole lot of impact along the, the western boundary of the basin. Uh, that is the east coast of India. Now, I will just uh, stop here for a while and uh, explain to you the circumstances. During when the Vikti jet hits Sumatra and produces a high in the Bay of Bengal, the winds are southwesterly. That's roughly made by May, those winds are well setting. They are southwesterly and therefore along this boundary, for example, they should be inducing upwelling. So what we have is a situation whereby a downwelling condition or higher sea level propagates from the equatorial region, but local effects tend to suppress it because there is an upwelling situation. In contrast, when Whitkey jet, the fall Whitkey jets, October, November, uh, and we are now looking at middle of October situation, reaches the Bay of Bengal, there is a high similar to the one in the eastern boundary, but now you have a high which can be seen almost along the whole of the bay, and you will see it when I run the movie forward. At this time, the winds are from the northeast, so they could be supporting the high which has come from the equator. So during the two seasons, we have contrasting situations. During summer, we have local effects opposing equatorial effects. During winter, we have local effects supporting the equatorial effects. And we see the impact of that uh, very much. Uh, you now notice this high that has propagated and keep watching. That high goes all the way around Sri Lanka, goes to the west coast of India, and that is how it sets up, just a minute, that is how it sets up a West India coastal current. That current is a Rossby Bay, and therefore it migrates westward. It continues to migrate, just a minute, it uh, continues to migrate and you can see it all the way to Somalia having an impact there sometime around March, April, just when uh, the Somali current is in the process of getting established. So this sort of information has come only recently. It was suspected from uh, 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 hydrographic data, but I think Altimeter has played a major role in this basin to define the phenomena because they happen so rapidly. And we didn't have the means of really recording them with the sort of resolution that we need. Okay. Uh, I will now run the same thing, but show the geostrophic velocities. Now you might uh, wonder how come if the, these are geostrophic velocities uh, uh, computed from dynamic topographies, how come we have those values on the equator? Good point. What uh, Abizo does is when 
close to the equator use, uses a small model uh, that uh, computes velocities using wind stress. And it sort of uh, helps to match them with the north and the south regions from where uh, the, uh, the geostrophic where the geostrophic velocities apply. So you now have a picture over the whole basin. And uh, let me run this uh, movie. You can keep looking for the same events, but what you will notice is you can now see the Witki jets much more clearly than uh, uh, what was seen in the sea level. Okay, so now this is February and you will soon see a uh, Witki jet forming. There it is. Okay, we have a Witki jet which goes and hits the boundary, it then uh, flows, but it doesn't have a whole lot of impact along the western boundary of the basin. Now compare this with what happens in October, November, uh, and so on. Now see, you can actually see it migrating downward along the east coast, around Sri Lanka, then set up the West India coastal current, then migrate offshore as the Rossby wave. This is a remarkable development uh, and awareness for it, uh, I think, needed uh, data like uh, uh, altimeter. So uh, what it has done, what this uh, altimeter data have done is they have allowed us to uh, put together the description uh, of the major events in the Indian Ocean. And this is a cartoon of it. Now, notice one thing. Arrows are one unidirectional south of the equator. Arrows north of the equator are double directions. That means they oscillate. They have an annual cycle and they change uh, 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 their direction. It's quite possible that some of the change happens mainly in the direction, but the magnitude of uh, uh, a current could be much weaker in one direction in comparison to the other. But nonetheless, there is an annual cycle associated with just about everything which happens in the northern uh, North Indian Ocean, that is north of roughly 10 degrees south or so. This is good. What is even better is it is possible to put all these developments in uh, perspective by using the equatorial waves or tropical waves as they are now known. And the most important ones which I have pointed out to you is the equatorial Kelvin wave which is notice is only on the right hand side of zero wave number that is K. That means this wave propagates only towards the east. These are representatives of Rossby waves. They occur only left of zero and therefore they propagate only towards the west. These are the two important uh, uh, features that we have seen. One must also take into account the possibility of coastally trapped beta plane Kelvin waves uh, north of the critical latitude uh, that, uh, that is defined. Oh, just a minute. Uh, what happened? Uh, am uh, I am I okay? I yeah, uh, you could open your slide right now. We can we can see your screen. Okay, uh, but your Gmail okay. is visible. Okay, is everything okay? Yes, yes, perfect. Yeah, okay, fine. So there are also uh, meridional propagating Kelvin waves, but it depends on the frequency of uh, uh, of the wave. Uh, for every frequency, there is a critical latitude and a Kelvin wave will exist to the north of that latitude and uh, to the south of that latitude, there will be 
only Rossby wave. So I have focused only on the Rossby waves and uh, describing that picture, uh, describing the movies because uh, I have looked at the two events, the Vitki jets as a six monthly uh, phenomenon. Uh, for a six month phenomenon, for the depending on uh, what is the mode that is excited, uh, for the first mode, the critical latitude is north of the basin, so it doesn't matter. For the second mode, it is about 20 degrees north, so it will matter for certain uh, uh, motions. But without getting into those details, the nice thing is that there is a framework available with which one can interpret just about everything that one sees in the uh, in the open sea. So uh, I think I have convinced you that processes in the Bay of Bengal, in addition to controlling circulation in the Bay, impact the west coast of India and even the coast of Somalia. More importantly, it is the dynamical framework which allows us to understand all these phenomena. And therefore, my vote for, uh, uh, for which is the more important of the two basins goes to Bay of Bengal today, because I think both dynamically and a little bit of thermodynamics, which I mentioned, uh, I, I find uh, the Bay of Bengal uh, very impressive. Uh, we also have a good dynamical framework to understand what uh, 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 what, uh, what it does. Now, let me go to the second part of my talk, which is what are the challenges that we are facing today? And let me ask a rather provocative question. The large scale circulation study that I've told you about, and uh, I think it has been a success, uh, was paid for by India's common men and women. It has produced uh, much needed knowledge and that is good and the community can be proud of it. But have we really studied problems that impact the common men and women more directly? Well, that depends on what such problems are and where they occur. Uh, let me tell you that they occur uh, close to the coastline. They occur on the Indian continental shelf, which is uh, very shallow and is separated from the open sea that I discussed by a, a slope. Uh, let, uh, next figure shows that we have the yellow area is the continental shelf. It is uh, uh, it's just next to the slope where this red line 200 meter uh, is next to the 1000 meters. So there the slope uh, topography changes quite dramatically. And it is in this region that most, the yellow region, where uh, most of uh, our uh, uh, our day-to-day -day problems are. And I will explain that a little later. The question here is, uh, can we uh, sort of assume that what we uh, see or what we have understood uh, from, uh, uh, from the large scale circulation, uh, is it the same kind that we see on the shelf? And this question could have been answered by putting current meters, say, across uh, the shelf and seeing uh, if their behavior is different. The problem is that that is not so straightforward. The shelf, which is the yellow area, is a busy region because it supports uh, navigational routes, fishing areas, and deployment of moorings is either problematic or almost illegal. As a result, question has this question of how does the shelf differ from the open sea uh, has remained unanswered. In the literature, however, you very often find uh, assumption that what happens in the open sea happens in uh, on the shelf. I think it needs to be checked, and I will convince you that there are that are new data which suggest 
that that assumption uh, needs serious reconsideration. Okay, before I do that, let me ask, what are the sort of activities that go on on the shelf? Uh, for one thing, uh, there are about 30 major ports and they are list shown here uh, with circles. Uh, their importance uh, as a major port or what's called a non-major port is indicated by whether it's a red dot or a, a red circle or a blue circle. In addition to it, there are about 200 intermediate ports uh, that are under state governments. Most of the domestic maritime shipping occurs between these ports and that occurs primarily at, uh, at the depth of about 70 meters. Now, uh, 70 meters means a line which is between this red line and the coastline. So somewhere in between, all these ships are plying. Uh, more importantly is another activity, which is, and we, we do have a large shipping activity, but even major is uh, the marine fisheries. Uh, this is a, a map which was given to me by Dr. Shanoi uh, from, uh, uh, through CMFRI. And the numbers that you see here is number of crafts flying in these areas, the steepled areas, which are the fishing grounds, is almost out of order of 200,000 craft of various size. Now, if INCOIS, which is our operational oceanography center in the country, is asked for help, what kind of information do people seek? Uh, Balkish Nair uh, gave me this uh, inputs, and this is a summary of it. They look for velocity, <clears throat> both climatology as well as forecast. <clears throat> they look for a daily forecast uh, of ocean currents. And there is a wide range of uh, users for it, fishermen, defense authorities, others. <clears throat> there, are, uh, there are subsurface currents which are sometimes required. They also need locations of eddies, tidal currents that we have not talked about so far, but which are important in the shallow areas. In addition, you need wind wave forecast as well as climatology. So you see, this is a narrow region, but a region that needs a lot of information uh, and uh, information which is sought after. INCOIS makes all these information available in addition to events like storm surges, tsunamis, and daily predictions of uh, or uh, predictions of potential fishery zones uh, sought after by the fishing community. They run numerical models to support this operational activity, and this job is being done to the satisfaction of their clients, job being done well. They run uh, very sophisticated numerical models. However, as a fish physical oceanographer, I miss a theory that allows us to interpret what models, uh, the, uh, the models of the Indian shelf predict. In other words, what I miss is an equivalent of a diagram like this, which would tell me uh, major carriers of information. Which direction do they go? Do they uh, remain uh, undamped as represented in this diagram? Or do they undergo damping? Uh, the, what are the important directions that one could expect? I think developing this information both through data analysis as well as through theoretical uh, analysis is what is uh, a challenge. And I will give you two examples of uh, where the challenge is, uh, uh, is quite striking. 
Uh, this diagram was given to me by uh, Shailesh Naik when he was at uh, SAC Ahmedabad. And uh, the purpose uh, he put, to get, put together uh, this uh, figure was to highlight the plumes that form uh, in coastal areas because of runoff that uh, comes from the continent. It is quite high here because of the Ganga Brahmaputra, but you find those red areas developing wherever there is a delta, Godavari Delta, for example. Along the west coast, we don't have deltas, but we have a large precipitation occurring because it's a region of uh, high precipitation. And you find plumes forming along the entire coast something which we have not recorded very well, but known to happen. And I'll show you just one uh, figure uh, to show that plumes uh, carrying low salinity water do form along the coastline. And uh, uh, along the west coast, it is more of a line source because these rivers are small, but carry, they carry enough water to form a, line, a plume all along the coast. More importantly, that plume is pushed towards the coast or should be getting pushed towards the coast uh, by the southwest monsoon winds. Uh, uh, we have not studied uh, what are the implications of all these things. We do know that the plume that forms is of the order of few tens of kilometers maybe 30, 40 kilometers. And, uh, but we have not studied its dynamics. Uh, we know that these plumes are important because they carry uh, uh, water that comes out of the estuaries, which uh, very often uh, are looked upon as nurseries for fisheries along the coast. So it can get more complicated and it could have implications to other things, uh, other branches of oceanography. Uh, recently, drifter data became available, and all that I've done is, and it's a monthly data, and all that I've done here is plotted the drifter, drifter data uh, on the salinity field. And what you notice is that when the salinity field, salinity is low, as low as 20 parts per thousand, this current uh, flows westward. As a matter of fact, this current flows westward almost 10 months of uh, this is probably its weakest signature, uh, maybe in December. But it flows westward almost throughout the year, even though winds in this area change direction. They go from southwest during May, July to northeast during uh, November, uh, to February, but the current goes in the same direction. Is this being driven by what is known in the literature as a buoyancy effect, which arises because of change in density rather than uh, uh, winds? We don't have an answer to that question. Even more interesting is a recent study that has been uh, carried out of uh, INCOIS. Uh, Government of India, the Ministry of Earth Sciences, has been installing uh, high frequency radars along the East Coast. And uh, uh, there are two of them, in one in Kudalur, uh, one at Kalpakam in this area. And this is a blow up of that. This is the Kudalur station. This is the Kalpakam station. And what this radar can provide is surface current uh, with a resolution of six kilometers uh, uh, every uh, uh, at a periodic time. I don't remember now exactly the time frame, but you can get a daily value of the mean current. Uh, I think these are hourly values that the instrument provides. So you can remove the tides from it and uh, uh, co construct a daily value uh, from it. Interestingly, because this region happens to be a very narrow shelf region, you get uh, currents on the sh shallow part as well as on the deep part. And 
the study looked at two such locations, one in approximately 50 meters and the other in, uh, I think, 1,700 meters or so. Let's see what it is. Yeah, uh, 1,700 meters. So one was 20 kilometers uh, uh, from the coastline at a depth of 50 meters. And the second is 60 kilometers from the coastline and uh, the depth is 1,700 uh, meters. Uh, what these data showed, and by the way, this region is a region which experiences an annual cycle, very well defined annual cycle in wind stress. Uh, so uh, this is the annual cycle. In addition to it, and this data goes uh, from 2014 to 2019, uh, there is a distinct annual forcing in the coastal region. In addition to other forcings, which go from days to uh, uh, months. Uh, now, this result was uh, published earlier this year. Uh, Bishwamoy, Paul, uh, Balaji Baduri, uh, Baduru, uh, Arya Paul, Francis, and I was uh, also involved. It was a pleasure to work on this problem. Uh, what it showed was that you do find occasions when the when you when you look at the low frequency data data which have been low passed by 100 days the red reds indicate a northward current blues indicate the southward current and i pointed out to you earlier a current which moves southward all along uh, during uh, november december january or so uh, it's very clearly present during these two years of data. Uh, there are occasions when uh, the, I, the EICC, that is the East India uh, Coastal Current, uh, has an impact on the shelf. And these are uh, depths, which are shallow depths, uh, up to here or so, is less than 50 meters. This is the 70 uh, uh, meters. But the more important thing to notice, if I plot the 50 meter and the 70 meter uh, value uh, side by side, what you find is the deep, which is the blue line here, uh, shows a distinct annual cycle. The green line, which shows the coastal, that is 50 meter uh, depth current, does not seem to have much of a resemblance to the deep current. It doesn't seem to have an annual cycle, even though the winds over the shelf region have an annual cycle. So the question is, what happens to, uh, let us say somehow, and uh, what I have told you just now is seen in uh, other data analysis, in uh, this wavelet analysis, which very clearly showed low frequency uh, oscillations uh, in, uh, uh, in the data, but distinctly absent in the 50 meter depth, 20 kilometers from the coastline. Question is, what brought about this change? And uh, uh, the answer seems to be uh, quite, uh, uh, quite uh, interesting in the sense that whereas in the open sea dynamics, Rossby waves, equatorial Kelvin waves, and perhaps beta plane Kelvin waves were playing a role. What happens here seems to be coastally trapped waves, coastally trapped because they move over a region of rapid variation in uh, that. Uh, the, uh, topography is playing a role, and analysis suggests that friction is also important in the region. Let me put that in terms of equations. These equations are quite similar to the equations that apply uh, over the open sea basin, except that it two terms. One is the friction term, and the other is the depth variation, uh, is the change. And that's why those Rossby waves and Kelvin waves of the open sea 
equatorial as well as uh, uh, coastal of the open sea uh, don't uh, don't uh, are, are not relevant they are more of shelf waves something which has been known from 1960s or so but understood much better only now uh, when uh, brink pointed out that it is the friction term that is noted here which makes uh, a shelf uh, support uh, motions which are only high frequency motions motions with periods less than about uh, 50 days or so uh, other motions happen to occur more in the slope area farther away from the coastline for example for short periods say less than uh, uh, 20 days or so you find a velocity structure which is trapped to the coastline trapped to the uh, varying topography but is closer to the coastline whereas as period increases trapping does occur except that the location of the high shifts farther towards the coast uh, farther towards the open sea okay this is more towards the coast this is more towards the open sea so if you look at currents here you don't see the impact of the low frequency whereas you do see the impact of those in the high frequency so what it suggests is that uh coastally trapped waves dominate in over the shelf uh something that we need to study in greater detail we need to study uh, these waves in the presence of friction because the only explanation why you don't see an annual cycle in the, this region in spite of the fact that the winds do have an annual cycle requires that you keep friction or take friction into consideration so uh, the cartoon is there is an open sea uh, circulation that i think we understand reasonably well there is a boundary current of the open sea region that is primarily driven by the open sea circulation but inland of that there is a different kind of dynamics altogether in the boundary current you could see the impact of uh, uh, of local driving merging with the boundary current but you don't see the impact of uh, but you don't see its impact what do you, uh, uh, you when you observe currents very close to the coastline uh, this kind of brings our understanding of the indian shelf in line with what is known about shelves elsewhere shelves elsewhere also have this property that most of them don't exhibit long frequencies they exhibit primarily uh, the uh, the sh- uh, the short periods or high frequency motions uh, before concluding however i should point out this is based on two years of high frequency data at one location a very special location because the shelf is narrow and uh, uh, it's in a way surprising that you see it even though the shelf is narrow but it is something which needs to be studied and uh, we also in, uh, th- there are such installations elsewhere they need to be examined and there are methods of representing friction which also need to be studied so le- let me conclude now with this summary i hope uh, the statement which i made that uh, bay of bengal is today more interesting than uh, than uh, what it was during the iiu days when it was kind of backwaters of the indian ocean Uh, the theory of equatorial open uh, ocean dynamics can explain uh, uh, the observations well the challenge today however is we need to develop similar theoretical framework 
to understand the processes on the shelf where a large fraction of our day-to-day -day, uh, activity is. I uh, Let me take this occasion to thank MOES again uh, for uh, their uh, uh, privilege to uh, privilege given to me to talk to you and I appreciate your attending this, this webinar. Uh, thank you for such an informative and explanatory talk, Dr. Dr. Shetty. So we have a couple of questions on uh, the YouTube chat. Uh, I'll just read you, read them for you. The first one is whether there are any study done for rise in SST due to hot jet streams in Bay of Bengal and Arabian Sea. Uh, I'm not aware of the phenomenon. Uh, I may just not have looked at the literature enough uh, to uh, talk about the streams that uh, you are referring to. But uh, I'm open-minded to the possibility that such things exist. And uh, new data, uh, which are primarily based, uh, with, uh, uh, based uh, with satellite sensors, uh, do provide a uh, lot of such information. But I'm not aware of it. OK, and the next question is, are we seeing an increasing role of Arabian Sea processes on air-sea interactions in the region in recent times? For example, more frequent tropical cyclones? Uh, well, tropical cyclones are more frequent in the Bay of Bengal than the Arabian Sea. And the main reason is that the sea surface temperature in the Arabian Sea is not very, is not warm enough to support uh, atmospheric convection. So, uh, but climate is changing. Uh, we do find sea surface temperature rise in the Indian Ocean. And uh, uh, Arabian Sea's importance uh, could uh, go up in the, uh, in the near future. Uh, but that has still to be uh, shown empirically. Uh, the next question is, in light of the new findings, what role does the Arabian Sea warm pool plays in modulating monsoon? Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I told you right in the beginning, I'm not a meteorologist. I'm not a, a specialist in this area. Uh, I think uh, this question is probably more relevant to, uh, to people who have studied the warm pool, and uh, so I I would rather not comment on it because I just haven't studied it uh, enough uh, to uh, comment. Right. Uh, we have one more question. What are the challenges to implement ocean mission program and how to move forward? Oh, that is a big, big question. Uh, uh, I think ocean mission is uh, uh, is going to create a lot of opportunities uh, for uh, oceanographers uh, to explore the oceans as well as uh, develop uh, our understanding. I have today identified one problem that is close to my heart, and I hope uh, that uh, there will be uh, resources available uh, to uh, construct uh, numerical models with high enough resolution uh, to look at uh, what I have just described to you as uh, something uh, that uh, data seems to be suggesting. Uh, I hope there will be theoretical studies that will be done in order to uh, understand those uh, numerical results because it's one thing to simulate things on a computer. It's another thing to really get an insight into what produced what. That is the reason why we need uh, uh, the support of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 a theoretical framework, which says things are going to propagate westward. And then you look at the altimeter, and you do find sea level propagating westward. Uh, you find uh, something on the equator is going to reflect along the eastern boundary, producing 
uh, a boundary forced uh, Rossby wave along the eastern boundary. Now, these are all possibilities, and I think uh, there will be uh, resources in the uh, in the deep ocean mission uh, to look at these uh, ideas uh, closer to analyze uh, them. And I hope our understanding of uh, the shelf will improve uh, uh, by the time the deep ocean mission is completed. Right. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, so in the interest of time, we will be stopping here. We were honored sure. to have you here. It was a pleasure and it was really a very, very informative talk. Uh, Roxy has written, I mean, a lot of people have appreciated you on the chat, but he has specifically written that there were some, these are some interesting points that were often overlooked. So uh, definitely those points were covered. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you all the viewers for joining us for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you viewers for attending this and uh, really appreciate it. But Marker, uh, we can stop.